Hello, and welcome to Grand Dukes of the West, Supplemental 8, Hooks and Cods. Today we're going to be finishing up our run of supplemental episodes by looking at Haino, Holland, and Zealand under the Vittles box. But I want to get started a little earlier with the first count of all three, John II of Aven. John II was the son of John I of Aven, who you might remember from my first supplemental episode on the feud between the houses of Aven and Dampierre. If you need a refresher though, here it is. Margaret the Black, Countess of Flanders and Hainaut, had two husbands, Bouchard of Aven and William of Dampierre, and had children with both. Unsurprisingly, the half-siblings didn't get along well with each other, and after a few wars between them, a settlement was reached where the Aven would receive Haino and the Dampierre would receive Flanders. During these conflicts, both sides looked for allies in the Low Countries. The Dampierre Count of Flanders married a daughter of the Duke of Brabant, while John I of Aven married a sister of the Count of Holland. As both the Counts of Holland and Flanders claimed Zealand as rightfully theirs, Holland became a natural ally of the Aven clan, and the two houses became quite close through the aforementioned marriage and regional politics. So a few generations later, when the Count of Holland died without children in 1299, his cousin, John II of Aven, was his closest male relative. But as I mentioned last episode, since he wasn't a direct member of the House of Holland, the King of Germany tried to declare the fiefs of Holland and Zealand vacant and take them for himself. But this was contested by many of the princes of the Holy Roman Empire, especially those with territories along the Rhine, as well as by France. The kings of France were also allied with the House of Aven, as they both had natural rivals in the Dampierre Counts of Flanders. Therefore, it was in France's best interest to assist the Aven in their expansion further into the Low Countries. Conversely, the King of Germany found an ally in his project in the Count of Flanders, but in the end, other issues prevented him from interfering with the Aven inheritance. The Count of Flanders did more to try and prevent John II from becoming the Count of Holland, but you might remember from way back in episode 4 that around this time, Flanders and France were in a bit of a scuffle that resulted in the capture of the Count of Flanders and the royal occupation of the county in 1300. So there wasn't too much that Flanders could do to interfere at this point. John of Aven took control of Holland and Zealand and made sure to ingratiate himself with the locals, especially with the merchants of his counties. He also managed to make his brother the Prince Bishop of Utrecht, which further managed to secure the Aven hold on the region. With popular support and with Flanders occupied by the French, John II was quite secure in his new inheritance, so much so that when the King of Germany came to Holland in 1300 to try and give his official stamp of approval to the inheritance in a face-saving measure, John chased him out of his county. The Aven hold on Holland and Zealand was briefly threatened after the Battle of the Golden Spurs in 1302. But despite a few setbacks and lost battles to the Flemish and their Brabantine allies, John II and his French allies pushed the Flemings and Brabanders out of Holland and Zealand. John died not long after the victory over the Flemish, so the mopping up would have to be taken care of by his son William. The mopping up turned out to be about 20 more years of on and off fighting between Holland and Flanders. In the end, William's hold on Zealand was affirmed in exchange for him giving up his claims to the parts of Flanders in the Holy Roman Empire, a decades-old ambition of the House of Aven. With peace in his counties secured, William could turn his attention to other affairs, such as dynastic aggrandizement. He had married Joan of Valois back in 1305 to secure his family's alliance with France. At the time, she was merely a cousin of the royal family, but in 1328 she became the king's sister when Philip of Valois became Philip VI of France. William and Joan had several children together, and these children were married to both low country nobility and foreign kings. Of particular interest to us, their oldest daughter, Margaret, married Ludwig the Bavarian, king of Germany and another daughter, Philippa, married the King of England. 
This marriage policy caused some complications when tensions rose between William's son-in-law, Edward III of England, and brother-in-law, Philip VI of France. But he died before the Hundred Years' War really got going, and so didn't have to worry about it too much. William's son, William II, ended up siding with the English, and even joined Edward's army in France on a few occasions. William II was quite the bellicose count, and spent much of his life on campaign. I just mentioned his time in France, but he also fought with the Teutonic Knights in the Prussian Crusades, on a minor crusade in the Levant, against the neighboring bishop of Utrecht when its new bishop attempted to throw off Holland's influence, and finally, against Frisia. We haven't talked much, if at all, about Frisia, but basically, it was the northernmost part of the Low Countries, and made up much of the continental North Sea coast west of the Jutland Peninsula. The Counts of Holland claimed ownership of Frisia, but this was often more theoretical than actual. West Frisia was finally conquered by one of the last Counts from the House of Holland, so when the event took over, the conquest was fresh and still uncertain. The event Counts worked to consolidate their hold on West Frisia and push further into the region. This was done with mixed success. West Frisia was successfully incorporated into Holland, but the attempted conquest of Middle Frisia, roughly analogous to the modern province of Friesland in the Netherlands, ended poorly, and ended up taking William II's life. As we all know, war is expensive. So during his reign, the war-loving William II routinely granted more and more privileges to the cities in exchange for money. Furthermore, the personal possessions of the count were also sold off where possible, and even that was not quite enough to pay for all of William's battles. When the Count of Holland died, he left a weaker and indebted office to his successor. These issues were compounded by the fact that William II and his father, William I, spent comparatively little time in Holland. Even when they weren't leading armies, they tended to spend more time in Hainaut than Holland. Wim Blockmans writes, quote, The event left the administration of far-flung Holland and Zealand to the nobility, who chiefly ruled according to their own interests. Their ambitions went largely uncontested by the burghers, whose cities were small, or by the clergy, whose power was centered in the bishopric of Utrecht, outside of Holland. But it was not all the nobles who ruled in the count's stead. The favorites of the event were the powerful van Duvenvoorde family and their allies. This created groups of winners and losers among the Hollander nobility, those empowered by the counts and their rivals. And without the regular presence of the count to reign in the nobles of the county, feuds began to emerge. Let's put a pin in that for now. When William II died in battle against the Frisians, he had no children or brothers. So the question of who would inherit his counties was up for debate. In Hainaut, the tradition of female succession had already been established, but in Holland, the practice was not necessarily accepted. There had been a Countess of Holland in the 1200s, but her legitimacy was questioned and she was driven out of power after a civil war. But after some arguments from people who didn't think that women should be able to rule the counties, it became clear that William's sisters would inherit them all. Now the question became which one or ones. In the end, Margaret, William's oldest sister, inherited all three counties. This was due in part to the fact that she was the oldest, and in part to the fact that she was married to Ludwig of Bavaria, the Holy Roman Emperor. And as Emperor, Ludwig had a good deal of latitude in deciding how imperial fiefs would be assigned during succession disputes. Margaret's sisters accepted this, and in 1346 she made her way north to her new counties. Margaret's reign got off to a bad start, but to be fair, most of the troubles went back to her brother's time as count. She attempted to pacify her new subjects by liberally granting them more rights, but she could do only so much when the commodal office was so in need of money. Margaret didn't end up staying in the Low Countries for long, and when she left, she put her son, William of Bavaria, in charge as her stadtholder, literally placeholder. And a few years later, Margaret decided to make William of Bavaria Count of Holland and Zealand in exchange for an annual rent payment. While Holland was figuring out who would rule it, the Prince Bishop of Utrecht, a member of one of the noble families that had been disenfranchised during the event's tenure in Holland, 
saw an opportunity to take advantage of the uncertainty in the neighboring county. This bishop, Jan van Arkel, had already tried to shake off Holland's influence during William II's reign, but had been defeated. However, the time now seemed right to make another attempt. In 1348, Jan van Arkel invaded a number of villages on the Holland-Utrecht border and managed to annex a few of them into his bishopric. William of Bavaria was able to push the Utrecht army back a little, but couldn't totally expel them from their gains. Once the situation with Utrecht was stabilized, William turned his attention to other things, like the fact that he couldn't afford to pay his mother her rent payments. Between the already indebtedness of the comital office, the weakness of that office, and the fact that the Black Death was currently spreading through Holland, William had a hard time convincing the towns and nobility of Holland to give him more money. And he also didn't have the spare funds to simply pay his mother from the Count's ordinary revenues. So he reneged on the deal, and Margaret came back in 1350 to reclaim the counties. Initially, William gave in to his mother's demands, but many of the nobles and towns of Holland refused to accept her. This party soon became known as the Cods, possibly a reference to how the Bavarian coat of arms resembles the scales of a fish. The noble families which became associated with the Cod faction were almost always the same families that had little influence while the Aven counts ruled Holland. Moreover, the cities of Holland tended to align with the Cod faction as well. On the other hand, those that supported Margaret became known as the Hooks, possibly a reference to the fishing hook. The Hook faction tended to be associated with the nobility in general, and the nobility who had run the show during the Avens' time in Holland more specifically. The tensions between the Hooks and the Cods first erupted in the city of Delft. After the assassination of a Cod nobleman, the Cod-aligned city rose up in revolt. Before long, the revolt had spread to the rest of the Cod faction, and by the end of 1350, many nobles and cities, especially in the north of the county, had risen up and declared for William. Meanwhile, William was in Haino with his mother, and Margaret was not happy that she was facing a rebellion in her son's name. She had William send letters to Delft and the other rebelling cities in Holland, telling them to submit to his mother, but these were simply ignored. Margaret then had William officially abdicate for a second time, but once again, this act was ignored. As the rebellion continued, Margaret's distrust of her son grew, and she worked to marginalize him. The powers and offices that he still held as her stadtholder were curbed, and there was even talk of removing him from that role. All of this prompted William to get in contact with the Cod rebels, and in early 1351 he escaped Hainaut and officially joined the Cod Rebellion. With mother and son now openly opposing each other, the conflict heated up. William's return to Holland prompted a surge in support for the Cod faction, and several towns and castles that had at first declared for Margaret changed their loyalties. William also managed to make peace with his old enemy, Jan van Arkel, the Bishop of Utrecht. Utrecht was in the middle of its own partisan conflict as well, and so an alliance between the factions in the region seemed natural. Jan van Arkel's family were major players in the Cod faction after all, and his enemies in the bishopric were beginning to align with the Hooks. Therefore, peace and a mutual agreement to expel the members of the enemy factions from the territories they controlled benefited both Van Arkel and the Cods. William and the Cod faction then went on the offensive and began taking more towns and castles by force. Margaret attempted to negotiate with her son, but William no longer trusted his mother and continued his offensive. The Countess saw that she couldn't oppose her son's army by herself, and so appealed to her brother-in-law, Edward III of England, for aid. After some convincing by Queen Philippa, Margaret's sister, Edward agreed to send a fleet to help the Hook forces. Meanwhile, William was still gaining territory and had made significant inroads into Zealand. So faced with the imminent loss of the county, the English fleet and Hook army met up and resolved to stop the Cod advance near the town of Fear. The Cods were defeated and pushed out of Zealand, but the success of the Hooks was short-lived. In an attempt to capitalize on their momentum, the Anglo-Hook force sailed up the Moss, or Meuse River, to take the battle to Holland. 
William and the Cods met Margaret and the Anglo Hook fleet on the Moss near the town of Svartaval. Unlike the Battle of Fear, the Battle of Svartaval was a decisive victory for the Cods, and many of the most important Hook leaders were either killed or taken prisoner. In the aftermath of the Battle of Svartaval, William was able to recover Zealand and consolidated his hold on Holland. The war was essentially over after about six months, but peace would not be made for a few more years. Finally, in 1354, Margaret and William came to terms. William would be recognized as the Count of Holland and Zealand, while Margaret kept Haino and would be paid a pension. It was essentially the same deal that had been established when William first came to the Low Countries, but now there was also a prisoner exchange. All in all, this first war between the Hooks and Cods only served to further entrench partisan hatred in Holland and Zealand. The conflict between Hook and Cod is often seen as a class conflict between the old nobility and the bourgeoisie of the cities, but at this point it was mostly one of political and personal rivalries. The higher nobility tended to be Hooks, while the lower nobility and urban elites tended to be Cods, but many cities sided with Margaret and the Hooks, and many high nobles sided with William and the Cods. Who was a Hook and who was a Cod had more to do with how you did while the House of Event ruled Holland than anything else. Vim Blockmans writes, quote, Long-standing local rivalries between families became the basis for choosing sides between Margaret and William. Once unleashed, the enmity between the Hooks and the Cods became the basis for which all political squabbles in Holland and, to a lesser extent, Zealand, were fought. While William had definitively won this conflict, the Hooks did not disappear. Margaret died a few years after peace was reached, whereupon William of Bavaria inherited Haino as well. But shortly after his mother died, William began showing signs of serious mental illness. Unlike in France, where no official regency was created for Charles VI, William's younger brother Albert was brought to the Low Countries in 1358 to take control of Haino, Holland, and Zealand. Albert worked to create a bipartisan comital council to rule Holland, but many of the Cods were unwilling to give up their so recently won dominance. A party of Cods attempted to ambush and kill one of the Hook members of Albert's council. The new regent did not take kindly to this attack, and knew that he had to push back against the Cods if he were to remain in control of the county. The Cods who attacked Albert's man fled to the city of Delft, a Cod stronghold that had been at the center of the initial revolt against Margaret. Albert put Delft under siege for a few months until the city gave in and sued for peace. As a part of the settlement, the regent forced the city to tear down its walls and pay a large fine. But apart from the rebellion of Delft and taking a handful of castles held by unrepentant cod lords, Albert's first years in Holland were marked by relative peace between the factions. Unlike his mother and brother, Albert had no strong ties to the Hooks or the Cods, so neither faction felt disempowered by him. In his treatment of Delft, he had shown that he was willing to respond to the factions forcefully, but he did not expand that forcefulness to the wider Cod faction and so was seen as fair. However, after a few decades of ruling neutrally, he took up with a cod mistress, and from there began to favor the cods above the hooks. This favoritism created much resentment, and began to overturn the fragile balance of power between the factions. In 1392, the resentment boiled over, and Albert's mistress was murdered by members of the hook faction, along with another important cod official in his court. Now the pendulum of Albert's wrath swung the other way, and he began a fierce persecution of the Hooks. The Count banished several members of the Hook faction and seized their property. He also allowed the relatives of his mistress and the officer to take revenge against the perpetrators of the assassination, which set off a round of bloody reprisals on a more local scale. This renewal of factional strife even made its way to the Commodal family, as Albert's son, William, was now aligning himself with the Hooks, and he was not immune from punishment. William was banished to England and wouldn't return to the Low Countries for over a year until Philip the Bold helped reconcile the two Bavarian princes. The father and son decided that a campaign against the Frisians would be just the thing to repair their relationship. 
And after the conquest of Vesterho and Osterho in Middle Frisia, William and Albert were on good terms again. This reconciliation was to the detriment of Jan van Arkel, not the Bishop of Utrecht, but one of his relatives. This Jan van Arkel was a prominent cod lord who held an important position in the government of Holland. Van Arkel and William of Bavaria had become bitter enemies during Albert's time as count, and Van Arkel had likely been the one pushing for William's exile in the first place. So when father and son reconciled, Jan van Arkel went into rebellion. The Arkel War could have lasted a few months, as Albert of Bavaria was able to force his wayward vassal back into the fold relatively quickly, but he died soon after this was done. When William became count, he renewed the struggle against Jan van Arkel, and after almost a decade of further fighting, the lands of Arkel were annexed into the personal domain of the Count of Holland. The Arkel War was the most prominent example of conflict between the Hooks and the Cods during William's reign. Unlike his father, who took a mostly balanced approach to the factions, even if he did favor the Cods later in his life, William firmly sided with the Hooks. The Hooks took advantage of their comital patronage, and throughout William's time as Count, they had the upper hand against the Cods. They were far more prominent in the government of Holland, and they could rely on the Count's support whenever minor scuffles broke out. But minor scuffles were really all that broke out during William's reign in Holland. However, this shouldn't be seen as the final victory of the Hooks over the Cods. If anything, the Cods were growing stronger and more restless. The class distinction between the factions, with the nobility tending to align with the Hooks and the cities the Cods, was beginning to grow stronger around this time. Of course, there were still noble Cods and urban Hooks, but in general, the factions were becoming more class based. And with the rise of urban power in Holland in the later 14th and early 15th centuries, this meant that the Cod faction was also growing in power, even as they lost influence in the government. So the Cods, ever more powerful, were looking to regain control of Holland, or at least make sure they had a piece of the pie. And when William of Bavaria died in 1417, they saw an opportunity to do just that in a dynastic conflict between William's daughter Jacqueline and his brother, John the Pitiless. Thank you so much to my patrons. Christine, Duchesse de Namur. Peter, Duc de Brancion. Elliot, Graf von Kravenstein. Anthony, Comte de chateauneuf nuxois James, Graf von Temsa. Preston, Comte de saint fargo Mark, Comte de Merso. Diana, Graf von Biersel, Mehmet, Comte Santerre, Chris, Comte de Simur, David, Graf von Bornem, Rosa, Comte de Germol, Elliot, Comte de bussy le grand Quinton, Graf von Blasfeld, Tyler, Comte de Chamaray, Ian, Graf von Arenberg, and to my Knights of the Duchy. If you want to join them, you can at patreon.com slash Burgundy. If you want to support the podcast in other ways, you can do so by leaving a review on your podcast app of choice and telling your friends about the show. Both really help to grow the show and will earn you my everlasting appreciation. If you want to keep up with the show, you can follow me at Valois Burgundy on Twitter or Blue Sky, or find Grand Dukes of the West on Facebook. You can also email me at granddukesofthewest at gmail.com and check out the podcast website for maps, images, sources, and more at granddukesofthewest.com. Once again, thank you for listening.